So good morning, my name is Christopher Gallup, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Public Administration at NC State University. I'm honored to be moderating this morning's panel. While we're getting some presentations set up, I just wanted to say a few opening remarks and introduce the panel, plus logistics, things like that. Shelly, thank you for your comments. Um, you know, I had this, this thing in my head what I wanted to say, but now of course that's right. So this is kind of just written. Joe Snow is a great thing. Great presentation for this. So uh, my family's from Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, both uh, grandparents, my grandfather worked in the steel mills five months after five months after I was born, uh, something called Black Monday, where 5,000 people lost their jobs in one day in the town. Uh, it was followed by um, a number of subsequent steel mill closings. And so the area has been through generations of, of trying to process what to do with these changing landscapes. That wasn't something I was planning on talking about, so as you're speaking to some of these things, it hits home. Because I've seen what that does, I've seen communities struggle with these larger economic and industrial transitions and struggle with how best to remake oneself in the community in light of some of these larger shifts. So this is such a great home, more so than I was planning. And so now, of course, my concentration shot. And so we'll just go from here and see how things go. When Jones reached out to me a few months ago about this, I was really intrigued by the, the, the title of this notion of shifting energy landscapes. On one hand, you have this sort of metaphorical shifting landscape, a shifting policy landscape. Uh, economic landscape, shifting technological landscapes. But you also have, also have these actual shifting, literal landscapes. So right here is a map from a 2013 report that came out from the US Forest Service called the Southern Forest Futures Project, where they looked at expected changes to forest extent, composition, health, ecosystem services, et cetera, over the coming decades. This particular figure shows uh, changes in urban area between 1997 and projected out to 2060. And the darker greens, and it's hard to see, but the darker greens are over 25% increase in urban areas. You're not seeing a lot of the browns, those are lost because urbanization tends to be a one way street. But uh, as you can see, the patterns are what you would expect a lot along the 85 corridor, um, and then also some hot spots around the existing metro areas. If you change some of your assumptions about what leads to that urbanization and ramp it up a little bit, this is a high growth scenario. The same sort of patterns just exacerbated a little bit. So we're actually seeing these physical changes. These changes are being driven by these larger, broader changes in uh, socioeconomic conditions, changes in the industry, and over the one that, as we heard in the last talk, this very contentious political environment, particularly along the urban rural divide. All of these things are affecting the land energy landscape. And in some of my work, you actually see that the energy landscape can actually affect the physical landscape, things like bioenergy, or the creation of a new market for a particular thing like uh, forest feedstock could actually result in an increase forest area relative to the absence of, of a market. And so sometimes you get energy landscapes affecting physical landscapes in interesting and unexpected ways. So I just wanted to tee that up with that a little personal uh, reflection as well as this, this intriguing notion of what is a landscape and how is it changing. So without further ado, I'd like to actually turn it over to the panel. Just by way of logistics, uh, I'm going to introduce everybody at the outset and then to them to, to present and hopefully have enough time again for some nice cross panel discussions. I'd like to ask if you have any clarifying questions, leave it up to the speakers as to whether they would like to take those after the talk. But if you have any big, deep, sort of, you know, what does this all mean, how does it all fit together type questions, let's save those for the end because I think that will really benefit from the full panel's uh, experience. So, at first, we have Blake Hudson, a professor at the University of Houston Law Center. After Blake will be Harrison Felt, Associate Professor of the Department of Agricultural and Resource and Economics at NC State. Following Harrison will be Marilyn Marsh Robinson, Partnership and Alliances Manager for Environmental Defense Fund. And finally, Melinda Taylor, Executive Director of the Kate Bailey Hutchinson Center for Energy Law and Business, University of Texas School of Law. Uh, it's, it's really up to you, whatever you're most comfortable doing. You can run around, take a mic. Yeah, I may, I may sit here. Yeah. Alabama. Uh, this is a picture of our property in South Alabama. 
about um, 80 miles very right north of the coast. It's the, about 500 feet of elevation, so it's um, the highest point uh, that close to the Gulf Coast in the whole southeastern region. Um, if you look at National Geographic's, what if all the ice on the Earth melted? Um, and then you see this, the sea level, the sea level rise and the new coastlines will be, we will own an island um, if that happens. And so, uh, so our property will be there. Um, at, least, at least that's some comfort, I guess, in the time of climate change. But um, anyway, so this, this uh, property is very special to me. I grew up um, being engaged in a lot of the forest management decisions that were made on the property. Uh, my grandparents relied on it for sustenance. My, uh, my parents and, and, and my brothers and I shifted more to a conservation uh, mindset with this property. And so, um, but, but I've seen firsthand uh, some of the economic transitions that rural areas are facing. Uh, this is the most rural part of the state of Alabama, a town of about 1,200 people. Uh, the county is about 27,000 people and shrinking um, uh, because, of, because of lost economic opportunities. And so, um, so many rural communities are in uh, transition economically, especially in the U.S. South. And um, I was glad uh, Christopher showed the, the uh, slide of the forest cover uh, in the U.S. South because that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, and in the, because the forest markets have been crucial to southern well-being for quite some time. And it really has been a convergence of two factors. Um, an oversupply of timber and lower demand due to a changing market landscape. So I'm a many of you have seen the, the Wall Street Journal article recently about uh, southern forest owners. Um, it was a really fascinating uh, article about basically 30 years ago, everybody said, hey, let's plant our land in timber. Uh, and, and this will be a good investment vehicle for us. Uh, and then in 30 years, we'll cut it. And uh, we'll have some retirement funds. We'll be able to pay for some kids' education, things like that. And everybody had the same idea at once, right? And so they all planted the timber. And now there's this huge flood of timber in the market. And prices have dropped precipitously uh, in that time period. And so, um, you know, if my parents needed the timber for sustenance, uh, it, we would be in trouble right now. Um, and a lot of our neighbors are. Um, and so, um, you can see here I'm at it. And I'll get to the Forest Service Futures Report in a minute. But currently, in the next couple of years, you'll see um, over here we've got the volume of yellow pine per acre of timberland uh, in 1980 versus 2020. You'll see it's much, much more yellow pine per acre uh, in 2020, which really signifies that blood. Uh, adjusted for inflation, the price of southern pine is down about 45% in the last 10 years. Um, So-called salt timber for making lumber is at a 50-year low adjusted for inflation. Uh, many question. Um, you know, if you, if you read these articles, a lot of people are saying, well, I don't know if I'm going to plant this back in timber. Why would I do that? You know, there's, there's going to be the glut of the foreseeable future uh, to make transition over to agriculture, urban development, and whatnot. So, you know, there's a lot of concern that we may lose these forests um, as working forests. Um, and so at the same time, the market is shrinking. So um, uh, here, here again is a, a, sorry, a prediction of the, the glut and then the price drop you can see over here from basically just before 1990 to the present. Um, and so, the, but there's also been a, a shrinking market. Um, these are a little bit older, but they show the, the paper mill closures as the pulp paper industry has moved overseas. Uh, they've shut down lots of mills, especially around um, rural Alabama where I'm from. And, um, and so there's, there's been lots of, of closures there were providing fewer markets for timber owners to put their timber into. And it has also affected prices, right? Because as demand, as demand drops and you've got supply, um, then that, that becomes a problem uh, affecting the price. And so, you know, this economic uh, transition has environmental implications. Um, and so, uh, you know, while there is a glut of timber currently, long-term projections look pretty bleak. As Christopher mentioned, the U.S. Forest Service Southern Forest Futures Report uh, predicts that these shifting uh, economic dynamics combined with population growth and other factors uh, will cause up to 13% of U.S. forests to be lost in the coming decades, primarily due to urbanization. Uh, but conversion to agriculture is also a risk. Um, this loss will be equivalent to virtually all of the timber in the state of Alabama. Um, so it would be like going from this, this is a, a NASA satellite uh, image of, of forests in the U.S., to this. Um, that, that's the one slide that took me the most time to do. Uh, <laughs> Microsoft Paint to actually carve out Alabama. Um, but uh, that you know that's that gives you a visual of the, 
<laughs> we're talking about a pretty good chunk of forest that would be lost. And so we tend to think about deforestation as something in uh, Brazil, but, but this is, uh, without a change of course, we may be poised to see massive deforestation um, in our own country. Um, and so, you know, I have argued in other work that scholars need to take into account what happens to southern uh, forest resources if markets are not available. Um, they're likely to be converted because of, of property distribution. Um, and so, if you look here, you see the private property in purple uh, versus public uh, property in green, the different shades of green. And, you know, 86% of the forest land in the southeast is privately owned. Um, and so we can take a cue from history. Um, we've been here before. Okay, this is what the southern landscape looked like around the turn of the century, uh, the, the 20th century. Um, so the south looked like a war zone. Um, Georgia was cut over. 75% uh, of the timber at any one point in time was gone in Georgia. Uh, it was, it, there was a, a kind of a, a combination of um, perverse laws, perverse tax incentives. It actually was a liability to have timber on your property. And so what people would do is they would have these annual, what they call woods burnings. Um, effectively, what it was was they would throw big parties and get drunk and go burn the trees down. Uh, uh, of course, uh, well, this was meant as an attempt of humor, but I think this guy's actually French, but you, know, you get the idea. That's a lot of effort, too. Come on. <laughs> He's got a lighter in one hand and a bottle of wine in the other. Um, but, uh, so, but this is an actual picture of what kind of something looked like. And so we've, you know, we've been there before um, with uh, southern timber being, you know, the southern landscape looking much different than it does today. There's lots more trees today than there were at the you know, turn of the 20th century. Um, so the point is that these types of markets are important uh, to both the economic well-being of rural southern states, but also to the preservation of forests and, and, and associated resources, biodiversity, and other resources. And if these markets contract, both of those things may be at risk. Um, much of the transitions literature to date is rightly focused on helping rural communities who are dependent on fossil fuels um, make a successful economic transition into a low carbon economy. Uh, but emerging alternative energy sectors could help some of these rural communities maintain and even expand economic opportunities. Um, so we might ask what might fill the void vacated by the pulp and paper industry and provide more demand to meet this oversupply. And, um, you know, one potential that's been thrown out there is, is wood pellet markets, right? So this is a picture of wood pellets. Um, and if, if you look at uh, this map, you see that at the same time, the um, uh, pulp and paper, that's the closures of pulp and paper, uh, you can see the growth of wood pellets it's kind of come in and fill the void there. Um, they've expanded rapidly uh, over the last decade. Um, a lot of people have argued that they could expand and help alleviate some of the problems faced by this flood in the market. Um, there's a company in England called Drax Biomass that has shut down three of its coal, three of its six coal-fired boilers uh, and transitioned them to wood pellets. Um, and basically, and when I lived in that bridge before I moved to Houston, you can see the big white domes there. Um, that's where they, they process the wood pellets and they let them sit in the, uh, the domes to dry out. Uh, and then they put them on a, a barge and they ship them 21 days over to England. You say, well, that's not the most efficient uh, use of, of, of uh, carbon, dioxide, carbon dioxide emissions, and, and it's not, but that's, that's what the, the demand from Europe is, is causing now. Um, it's not the first time that the British have, uh, you know, they, they, they used a lot of our trees in the southeast to make their, <laughs> their navy um, fairly on in our industry, so they're still using our trees. Um, but, um, so most of the pellets go to Europe. You can see here the demand um, to Europe, and again, this has gone up even more since this, this, since this chart was um, put out. Um, and you can see here that wood pellets still make up a small fraction of overall forest removals in the south. So if you look at the blue there, that's the wood pellet removals compared to the removals for pulp and paper and the removals for salt timber. Um, that is for pine, and that's for hardwood, slightly more there for hardwood. Um, so it could provide some advantages. Uh, it's a renewable resource. You know, one of the things that, um, and I'll get to the pushback against them here, here in a bit, but one of the things about the resources, um, you know, we don't have battery storage technology yet. You know, I'm part of the decarbonization project. I would love to see us on full wind and solar uh, as soon as possible. But, you know, the, the arguments that we are technologically able to, to get a, a, far, a long way toward that goal 
here very soon, but right now we don't have the battery storage capacity or, or other mechanisms for ensuring um, that supply can always meet demand. You know, we run peaker plants. You know, you can either run a peaker plant, um, obviously with coal, or you need something that you can quantify that you know exactly how much to burn or, or to, to generate uh, at times of peak demand, uh, especially as climate change makes heat, uh, the, the, the south get warmer. You're going to have spikes during the day of uh, uh, heat waves where you need to be able to um, provide electricity more reliably. Um, the peaks are going to get worse, in other, in other words. Um, and so, you know, the thing that strikes me about trees is they grow back and they, they also, you can quantify them, you know exactly how much to put, um, to put on the, in the boiler to, to burn to meet demand. So that, that's one potential advantage there. Um, you could envision, as Christopher said, that you could even expand forest stocks on currently unforested lands to meet demand. You know, when you drive through central Alabama, you'd be surprised at how, how much is just open field. Uh, and there's some catfish farms out there, but it's just like this cultural history of leaving Leaving, uh, leaving that area kind of open pasture, even though the, the agricultural is agricultural not a big deal uh, in that space anymore. Um, so maybe we can expand some of these forest stocks in these areas. Um, it doesn't make carbon dioxide, um, and I'll get to the, some of the science behind that in a minute, but um, it, it, is, it, it could eventually be a closed loop. If you can guarantee that you're planting the trees back, then you're kind of burning the thing, and you should re-sequester your carbon dioxide. Uh, it doesn't have the same coal pollutants that coal has either, um, uh, as far as some of the sulfur oxides and mercury and things like that where it's burned. Um, but there are a lot of problems. Um, it, uh, it emits CO2, right? So, so one of the big scientific debates is, depending on which study you read, one says, you know, it, it takes so long for trees to re-sequester that carbon um, that we're still putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and we could push past a tipping point uh, that we can't recover, that we won't be able to recover from, even if it does re-sequester that carbon dioxide much later. And, and there's there's literally some of those arguments and other studies that said, yeah, but if you're looking at the, you're, you're not taking into account the potential expansion of the forest, you're, you're also looking at particular stands of trees instead of looking at the forest system as a whole. So there's been some critics of that. Another big issue that's, I, I believe, more problematic are the environmental justice issues. Where are these plants cited? Um, one report found that recently found that over half of the plants that I, I showed in the chart earlier had been cited in environmental justice communities. Um, and while the generation of electricity from wood pellets may have fewer co-pollutants than generation from coal, the process of turning them into pellets uh, does release some, uh, a number of harmful pollutants that can affect these communities, and that's a major concern. Um, and the siting is, is definitely more complicated. Um, I think that's something that, that we, you know, if, if this market does take hold, we've got to be smarter about that and, uh, and have some policies in place to take those things into account and, and alleviate the pressure from these communities. Um, but I do believe uh, Bill Schlesinger at Duke has been one of the, the scientists kind of leading the charge against wood pellets uh, as, a, as a means of generating electricity. I, I respect them a lot. But I do, if you read through some of their reports, I, I do believe they're somewhat cherry picking. They're picking the worst case scenarios um, when they're doing their analysis. Um, you know, they talk about trees that take 100 years to grow back fully. Well, that's, and, and they also talk about a lot of these uh, North Carolina bottomland hardwoods, right? So, to me, these are the low hanging fruit. These are the egregious examples where we should not be culling those trees for, for, for wood pellets, right? But I think they forget that most of the timber land where this would occur is already on a culture pine plantation because the pulp and paper mills have been using it that way for generations. Um, and, and, and it just merely kind of mimics that, that same approach uh, going forward, um, just provides a different market. Um, and so I, I don't think that it poses the risk to biodiversity and, and all the other um, uh, concerns that social media and and other scientists have uh, in that regard. Um, and I'm not, I'm not saying we should definitely be using wood for electricity at all. Uh, it certainly could go south, uh, so to speak, um, uh, without adequate checks, um, regulatory policies ensuring that forests would be replanted may never come about, right? We're in a very lax regulatory uh, mindset environment here in the southeast, and so if you don't have those, those um, safeguards in place, it could, it could go bad. Um, but, and there are not any policies protecting natural forests, right? Um, and you, you need those to protect those bottomline hardwoods in North Carolina. Um, we also need social policy, making sure that environmental justice considerations are being valued. Um, but at the very least, I, I do believe we need more nuance in how we talk about this. Um, because I can foresee a future where the South goes back to being 75% cut over. We've lost a tremendous amount of forest resources. Uh, we've got uh, solar panels everywhere, wind turbines everywhere and concrete and box, big box retailers and agriculture, right? I, 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 I just wonder um, if that doesn't make Southerners poorer economically and environmentally as a result. Um, 
you know, it, 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 you know on, on, on the other hand, I guess it does seem possible that we could have expanded, uh, expanded forest resource base, which might help with uh, some of the regional um, issues associated with climate change. Um, we have a closed loop energy source. And we do face some hard, uh, hard choices. Um, but I guess at the end of the day, we can maybe better live in a world with lots of forests that are burned for energy and then replanted than in a world of no forests and solar panels and wind turbines everywhere. Um, and so, the, you know, I guess the optimal would be to have forests uh, everywhere and in the solar, right? But, I, you know, as, as I tell, try to convey to Schlesinger and others that uh, we live in a very uh, lax regulatory environment in the southeastern U.S. Here's a study that was done, I'm about to wrap up. Here's a study that was done that shows that uh, they, they ranked on a scale of 1 to 10 the regulatory, um, how, how rigid the regulatory rules were as far as safeguards for forest protection in the southeastern U.S. scored a 1, uh, less than uh, Brazil and some of the other <laughs> developing countries, which doesn't mean that forest management in the south is worse than Brazil because laws and books <laughs> don't really go so far if you don't enforce them. Um, but, but it does give you kind of a sense of how um, Southerners do look at the kind of regulatory environment. So in closing, I just think it's important for policymakers and analysts to treat this issue with more nuance than it's currently given. Um, there could be some real unintended consequences and even negative carbon dioxide co consequences to transitioning to a particular set of alternative energies without consideration to the economic pressures faced by rural societies and resource-rich but largely privately owned regions of the country like the U.S. So that I'll close. Thank you very much. So as we transition to Harrison, are there any quick questions for Blake?
So as I was saying, I'm, a, I'm an energy economist. I focus mostly on, on US-related energy um, issues. And, and I think Shelley's uh, intro really teed up what I would like to discuss uh, very well. So um, as she mentioned, there's a, there has been a big shift uh, in the way we generate electricity in the US. And so uh, this graph kind of shows that fairly uh, cleanly. So that top blue line is total generation uh, in the US. It's been roughly flat for over a decade now. Um, but where we get our power from has changed massively. And while we talk a lot about renewables and the growth in renewables, which has been impressive, the major shift in our US electricity sector is the switch from coal to gas. So uh, a decade ago, about half of our power came from coal, and now about 30% of our power comes from coal. Uh, less than 20% came from gas, and now over 30% comes from gas. At the same time, renewables growth has gone from basically zero, uh, to now wind and solar accounting for a little over 7.5% of our total generation. And most of that, over 6% of that, is coming from wind. So wind has been picking up a lot, solar very recently has been picking up a lot, but the big shift is uh, coal to gas. So as we think about impacts on, on rural communities and impacts on, on the U.S. as a whole, uh, I think there's a few spatial questions that are important to consider here. Um, so first, where is this increased natural gas production and generation occurring? Similarly, where is this decreased coal production and coal generation occurring? And along with those questions, we're also concerned about where is this expanding re uh, renewable capacity taking place? And then finally, um, I think there are a lot of interesting market as well as non-market impacts associated with this evolving generation source. So I have a few figures here uh, over the next few slides to kind of set the table for some of this. I'm not going to answer all these questions, but at least give you guys uh, a picture of, of what really, uh, where some of these changes are occurring and, and what that means both for, for rural communities as well as, as non-rural communities. So let's think about our, our primary fuel production, coal and gas. Right, so all of our, our rapid expansion in gas fire generation is due to the fall in gas prices. That fall in gas prices is largely due to fracking, not largely, almost exclusively due to fracking. So where is this occurring, and where is that occurring relative to our coal fire, our coal uh, mining? So the map on the left is our uh, map of our major uh, fracking place in the U.S. And the map on the right is uh, our, our coal production centers in the U.S. Now, interestingly, uh, there's actually quite a bit of overlap in these areas. So we have the Appalachian coal, uh, which is declining rapidly, but we also have a massive expansion in Appalachian uh, natural gas uh, with the Marcellus shell. Uh, we have southern area uh, coal, air, um, coal sources. Um, we also have uh, a lot of uh, natural gas that is spreading from, from Texas up into to Arkansas. Um, we have a lot of uh, coal production coming from the central uh, western U.S., Wyoming, Colorado area. We also have a large uh, natural gas play in those areas. So as you think about some of this economic displacement of our coal, fire, uh, of our coal uh, production, um, I think it's also important to consider there's also been pretty rapid expansion of the natural gas uh, extraction sector in a lot of those same geographic areas. Um, this is an overlap of geography that's not discussed as much, uh, but it certainly exists. As we think about the generation side of this, uh, in terms of natural gas generation, while there's been a massive increase in the amount of power we generate from natural gas generators, uh, the actual physical landscape of, w of where those generators are hasn't changed a lot. Right, that is, we had a lot of idle capacity of natural gas generation, and now some of that capacity is being used up. We have added capacity in the natural gas generation sector, but not to a point where you can visibly see it, uh, a major difference over time in that. Now that is uh, as opposed to what we have for coal generation. Right, so uh, the map here on the left is all of the coal generators listed as operating uh, according to the EIA, in 2012. And then the map on the right is, is that same designation for coal plants in 2017. 
And what you can see is that there's uh, certainly a thinning out of the coal-fired generation, and a lot of that is concentrated in the Midwest and in the Northeast. Right? And so as we think about who is benefiting, who is losing in these, in these uh, post-production of our primary fuels and then production of our electricity, it's important to remember that it's not uniform. Right? Um, certainly those in the Midwest are feeling more of a pinch uh, from the declining coal than, say, those in, in the Southwest where there, really, there wasn't really a, a lot of coal fire generation to begin with. A similar story holds when we think about renewable generation. Right? So um, the map on the left here uh, is renewable uh, wind, is a wind generation uh, in the U.S., all the different uh, wind sites. And the map on the right is our, uh, our utility scale, which makes up the majority of our, our uh, <coughs> solar generation in the U.S., our utility scale generated facilities. All right, so what you can see here uh, on the um, wind generation map, a lot of our wind generation is focused in the middle of the country. All right, so when we talk about renewable generation, I think it's important to remember this isn't uniformly happening everywhere. Wind is is very concentrated in the middle. In fact, over 50% of our wind generation comes from four states, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Iowa. Right? Um, and it gets falls off pretty dramatically if you look at Texas generation relative to the next state. Um, there is a bit more in, in coming in now in the upper Midwest and, and some in the Northeast uh, and, and more in the West. You see huge hole in the Southeast. There's no wind generation. Right? There's like one little guy uh, in, in Tennessee and in, in a plant in, uh, in North Carolina, but for the large part, we don't have wind generation here in the southeast. Uh, over here on the uh, solar side, again, this is not a resource that is uniformly distributed across the uh, country. Right? Most of our solar generation by far comes from California. Uh, the, there's a large bit of capacity also in, in Arizona. Uh, North Carolina is the second, has the second most capacity installed. I always like this map because you could, even if I didn't have the borders uh, of the states here, you could almost trace out where North Carolina is. Um, now, some of you might not be from North Carolina, you might be from South Carolina, you might be from Virginia. It's not any sunnier here in North Carolina than it is in South Carolina or Virginia. The reason we have solar here is purely policy, right? And the reason uh, uh, we don't have it in other regions is also policy driven, right? Um, so as we think about, um, again, this expanding renewable base, it's important to remember this isn't blanket happening across the uh, US, it's happening very regionalistically, and it's driven by policies in those regions, right? Um, yes, there are federal policies that are pushing uh, solar and wind, uh, but uh, at least in particular for solar, uh, it, it's largely driven by local policies. Now, another part of that story, um, when we start thinking about equitable uh, issues or uh, uh, equity issues within who's going to bear the capital uh, brunt of, of this expanding renewable source. The other part besides the policy to think about is, is the actual uh, renewable resource capacity or renewable uh, generation uh, resource here. So it's not a mistake that all of our wind generation or a large part of our wind generation is strung between Texas, West Texas, up through uh, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Iowa. If you've ever had the pleasure of, I grew up in those areas, if you've ever had the pleasure of, of driving out there, it's windy and flat and uh, lacking trees. It's a great place to do uh, wind, uh, wind generation. Um, likewise, it's not a mistake that we don't have much in, uh, in the southeast. It's relatively poor uh, from a wind resource perspective. So again, as we think about uh, who's going to be impacted by renewables, um, uh, which community is going to bear the burden, it's important to remember um, that's, that we're, we're going to have to put some of these things in places where we actually have resources for them, right? And we have wind resources in the middle of the country. We have solar resources in the southwest part of the country, right? Uh, if we want to get a lot of generation from those sources, we're going to 
environmental perspective, uh, we're going to have to build them where uh, they can actually achieve a lot of uh, a lot of uh, generation. And then finally, um, let's think about uh, what some of this is doing to prices. So here are uh, the um, average electricity rates by county across the U.S. Now, one thing to note here, um, while we're growing this renewable base, while we had this shift from uh, coal to gas, and all of those things are somewhat geographically uh, specific, um, they don't necessarily correlate super well to what's going on with electricity prices, right? So um, we have relatively uh, low renewable generation here in the southeast, but we have relatively low prices still. We have a lot of uh, renewable generation in the middle of the country. That doesn't mean that we have super low prices in the middle of the country. You see quite a few uh, red counties, which are higher prices, uh, in, in, the middle of the, uh, in the middle of the country. Um, likewise, California, which is leading the way in renewable generation in a lot of uh, respects, uh, that's not necessarily mean they're also going to have super low prices. In fact, it is part of the reason why they have extra high prices for uh, power in California. Um, so, uh, in conclusion, I think when we think about uh, renewable, or when we think about energy transition impacts on rural communities, it's important to think that it's important to remember that, that the transitions that we're seeing in our uh, energy sector are not geographically uniform. That there is a lot of heterogeneity as we move from state to state, as we move from county to county, right? So rural areas in the southeast and their uh, impacts they're feeling from the energy transition might be quite different than a rural county in West Texas, right? Or Southwest Arizona. Um, and so I think as we, as we uh, today, as we talk about all of these issues, um, um, we need to, to keep in mind the, the heterogeneity uh, and both the market side and, and the correlated environmental side that is going on with, uh, with these transitions. So I'll, I'll leave it there for now and, and uh, turn it over to our next speaker.
approaches to our work. Um, we were founded by scientists, so science is very important to us. Um, and so our partnerships, um, we partner with corporations, communities, um, farmers, um, academics, um, just um, we have a lot of allies that we uh, work with. Um, we know that incentives are important, and so um, to develop win-win solutions, and then also um, working together to um, to get the policy right is also um, is also important. So today I want to talk a bit about um, rural electric co-ops. Um, nationally, there are over 900 uh, rural electric co-ops. Um, they are nonprofit, member owned, um, and they serve over 50% of the nation. At first, that uh, Environmental Defense Fund, um, and as I noticed with other organizations that we work with, a lot of people focus on urban areas or investor. Um, own utilities like Duke who uh, service the urban areas primarily because of population that's where most of the people are, right? Um, I'm from a rural area and so rural areas are pretty important to me and also um, over three quarters of this country is, is, a, is rural, is considered rural. So um, we started looking more at uh, rural electric co-ops. Um, um, and in North Carolina, we found that, um, you know, they worked in over 93 of our 100 counties, um, serviced almost a million households. They're not regulated by the PUC, they are regulated by their board, um, and they are, like I said, member owned. Um, the way I approach my work um, is to not only look at things through an environmental silo, but to look at a, a things with a holistic view. And so, um, it was important to think about um, working with rural co-ops, to take a moment and just think about rural communities. I don't, um, and some of this Shelley talked about earlier, and I think Blake, also alluded to in some of his comments, um, rural communities tend to have, you know, a higher percentage of elderly and also the veteran population. Um, you know, these populations definitely require um, more resources, um, and sometimes rural communities can't um, accommodate that. Um, loss of revenue from declining traditional industries. So we know that fishing, farming, manufacturing, those industries have declined. And so rural communities have suffered uh, from that. And just the lack of um, economic uh, development opportunities in general. Um, higher unemployment and poverty rates, you see that in rural communities. Um, non returning youth after high school or college. Um, I have two brothers, all of us left home after high school. My parents knew that we were leaving home. Um, I come from Chatham County, um, and we knew probably after middle school that we were leaving, we were leaving home. Um, and um, a lot of my friends did too. We still own land in Chatham County, um, but we knew that we would likely not return home. Although I have been thinking about that recently. Um, so that's something I think that people don't think about, that there is not a lot of youth in, um, in rural areas, and um, that can be a burden um, when you think about workforce, but um, we have to have opportunities to keep people there. Internet and connectivity gaps, um, there's a lack of broadband, a lack of internet in rural areas, so there's a huge digital divide. What does that mean? That means a lot. Um, if you're a business, you are not going to want to locate in an area that you cannot be globally competitive. 
So that's going to stop a lot of um, people from considering their area, right? Um, schools are going to be less competitive, right? Um, think about medicine, telemedicine. Um, I was a caretaker for my dad for 12 years. Without telemedicine, without the ability to have cameras in the home so we could see him 24-7, which he didn't like, um, but we liked. It was the only way he could stay independent and that he could stay home. Um, without internet and, and that connectivity, he wouldn't have been able to do that. So think about, you know, it's more than just one thing. Um, energy providers need that, right, in order to help with demand response and to help be more resilient and to help with better service providers. When companies want to locate to an area, um, and I learned this from um, talking to rural co-ops, um, they want to know what's your response time, how, how quickly do you get back up and the power goes out, um, and the internet is a big piece of that. So that's why I wanted to bring that to your attention. Um, the housing stock is older, um, and then we talked about energy burden, right? Um, so I just wanted to bring up a few maps. Um, the North Carolina Department of Commerce comes out with county tier designations. Have you seen this map before? Um, so every year they come out with county tier designations, one through three. Um, number one is uh, the most economically challenged in the state. Um, and so that's the light color. Um, a lot of the areas are in rural areas that are most economically challenged. A lot of those are serviced by rural co-ops. Um, the areas that are in red are significant uh, natural systems. Um, and, I'll, and I have a map that speaks to that and why that's important as well. So I just kind of want you to note um, some of these areas with economic challenges. These are also the areas that have, um, again, a lack of broadband, food insecurity issues. About in North Carolina, one in five children um, have don't know where they're going to get their meal from. So, again, this is rural America that we're talking about. Biodiversity, wildlife, and habitat rankings. Um, this is. Um, <coughs> I'm just showing this map, and this was created by Resourceful Communities, one of my mentors since I've been um, at media for almost 20 years, has been Mickey Sager over at the Conservation Fund. And Mickey uh, taught me that when you work with the communities, you need to, you need to know who you're, you're getting ready to work with, and um, not only by talking to them, but um, looking at maps. And so by looking at this, you're looking at um, a lot of protected lands, um, habitat, wildlife that we value. You can um, look at that and, and realize that these counties aren't getting revenue from those protected lands, right? And so those are a lot of the tier one and tier two counties. So that's another economic challenge for those counties, right? So just again, thinking about this um, total landscape. 2018 health outcomes. Um, map. Has anyone seen this map before? Okay, so um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation puts out this map um, and it ranks the counties in each state. Um, again, if you look at kind of those tier one, tier two counties, they have some of the poorest rankings in the state. Um, and they look at education rates, the percentage of people with insurance, Children in poverty, teen births, preventative behaviors, access to health care. In rural communities, you don't have the choices of hospitals. You have hospitals closing and so forth, right? Um, if you don't have internet access, I know like my insurers, they have a lot of education now on the internet that you can access, right? About different ailments and things like that. Um, well, if you're in a rural community and you don't have internet access, you don't have that same opportunity. So again, I just gave you the personal example about telling that, right, um, and how that helped me personally. So um, again, this is all just giving you a peek into some of the challenges of, of rural America. Now, the elephant in the room, 
Um, we talked a little bit about environmental justice, and we can talk about um, some of the issues in the state. Wood pellets, um, Blake is also in our state. The Diva has come to a couple of counties, Richmond County, um, Wilhampton County. Um, Dogwood Alliance has been fighting that. Um, Hall Farms, why there may be opportunities with um, biogas, there are also some concerns. Um, the uh, ACP pipeline and others, um, things that communities are concerned about. Um, that's not the root cause of the problem. Um, the root cause of the problem is what led to those decisions in the first place. And those are things that we often don't like to talk about. Um, and those are a lot of isms, racism, classism, um, sexism in some cases. When we talk about environmental justice, some people think, oh, that's only people of color. It's not just people of color. Environmental racism is, but not environmental justice. Environmental justice also means low, people with uh, low income. So that can mean poor whites as well. And so we have to look beyond um, the surface and, and, and dig a little bit deeper. We look at the power analysis. I come from an organization that is international that comes with a lot of privilege. And so when I sit down with grassroots community groups, I have to acknowledge that I am coming with privilege, right? And so I have to check that at the door um, and really and humble myself and, and I need to listen to communities. Because first of all, they know their community better than I do. And so a lot of times we need to kind of check our privilege at the door and realize that there are power imbalances at stake. Um, and then also power imbalances in the community. Growing up, I saw a lot of things in my county that were done um, under the table. I just grew up with a different type of family. I grew up with a lot of um, um, organizing. Um, I knew I could go any place that I wanted. I knew that I could do anything that I wanted. Nobody could not tell me not to do anything. Those things were instilled in me. As part of volunteering with the Environmental Justice Network for 10 years, I have um, worked with people to go visit their legislators at the General Assembly that were significantly older than me that really did not know that they could do that. And that humbled me because I thought everybody knew that they could do that, right? But um, people had, you know, we worked with people, coached them, and then to see them act within their power, right, was, was a really strong thing, but that's what we have to do sometimes. Um, sometimes people say, why don't people just stand up for themselves? Well, sometimes they need help standing up for themselves. It's not that they don't want to, sometimes they don't know how to. And sometimes we have to be patient. And so sometimes when we're talking in these rooms talking about this, or we're writing grants talking about what we want to do, right, we have to account for a time to work with communities where some of these uh, root causes, right, may have us taking a longer time than the pace that we would normally go if it was with our normal. Um, our peers that we usually work with. Because um, these are communities that are perceived as the communities of least resistance, but they are very powerful once they're organized um, and they can make change happen. Does that make sense? Okay, great. I'm going to move on. Um, another thing that I've seen um, is we talk to people just at different levels, and we need to meet people where they are. Sometimes, and I've seen it at, um, I'll use my organization at EDF, sometimes we'll talk about carbon emissions, and you know, we'll talk way up here when somebody is concerned about, I just want my energy bill to go down, right? And so you've to totally lost them when you start going into your issue and your talking points. Um, we need to meet, we need to do a better job of meeting where they are. And that's the partnership side that's coming out of me. Um, and so we need to listen to people and just meet them where they are. And we'll get to the carbon, reducing the carbon emissions 
when we meet that need of decreasing that energy bill, we'll, we'll we don't get to the thing that we want to, but let's meet their need first, right? And so sometimes we just have to remember um, the hierarchy of needs, right? And speak to people's needs and values. It's even what Harrison was talking about, um, um, because of our RNPS and policy, we're number two in solar. Um, that's done because, you know, we change our talking points depending on who's in office, right? So whether it's energy security jobs or we're talking about environmental issues, we, we're able to do that. Okay, I'm gonna wrap it up. So um, these are just where all the co-ops are located. Again, if you can remember some of those maps and, and, and where some of those tier one and two counties were located. I'm just going to briefly touch on a couple of programs, um, Upgrade to Save, um, and a number of co-ops have programs where they allow um, member owners to pay for energy efficiency improvements, um, and then they can pay them back on their bill. Roanoke Electric does this with a tariff. They, had, they started out as a loan. Um, but people were um, unable to, one, qualify for the loan and um, just was unable to carry that additional debt. And so by moving it as a tariff-based program, they were able to pay for the energy efficiency upgrades and then do a cost recovery, right? And so they have done over 350 to date so averaging about 7,200 per upgrade. This has put over $2.5 million into the economy, jobs, economic development, right? Um, and this is um, something that's very positive for, for that community, right? Um, like I said, other co-ops have um, done things. I think they replaced about 300 heat pumps um, as well. Community solar, several co-ops have community solar. Um, some installations are large um, and some installations are, you know, uh, are small. I think that the key is, again, you have to know your membership. Um, some installations, you have people of different income size and they can buy several. Some installations, um, because of uh, one of electric, they have mostly tier one counties, and so they had to fundraise and um, had to um, have someone call share and, and help pick up the cost. Members were interested in the program, but just couldn't afford to, to uh, buy um, a share of, of the community solar. So again, knowing your membership and tailoring a program especially for them, again, we can think about things in this room, but then working with the partners on the outside, that's when we can tell the solutions, right? Um, and I just want to highlight um, this, this will be my last one, I promise. Um, Tidelands EMC, um, co-ops are doing amazing things. You have um, microgrids, which is tying several things, right? Demand response, uh, storage, and microgrids together. Last year, when they did have a power outage, um, where a contractor um, ran over their transmission line, they were able to keep um, residents of, um, I think it was Overcoat, um, Michael, you I'm looking at you, um, together, um, keep them online because of this microgrid project. And so, but um, Wi-Fi thermostats, um, storage projects, they're all um, happening. Um, within um, your rural co-ops here in the state. And so that is my presentation.
Can I make one comment? I'm Mike Kelly for the Electric Cops in South Carolina. A lot of what you talk about, I could just go home right now. Uh, I'm here to be on the second panel. Uh, the person that you mentioned, or the, the cop you mentioned at Roanoke, has got one of my mentors. Curtis Wynn is the CEO. He leads from a sense of purpose. He's connected to the community. When you started talking to me, I was a little nervous about where you were going, but I think you hit on a lot of good things, including the isms. Uh, Curtis and I both were invested in things like Teach for America and stuff. I think one of the things that makes co-ops exceptionally special is my purpose is my folks deserve more than electricity. And I just want to thank you for bringing that perspective.
The estimates are that there are two to three times that much oil left in the Permian, and that's because the shale rock that's located there is 4,000 feet thick in some places. So even reserves that have been developed now with um, hydraulic fracturing, the operators can go in and, and basically drill new layers of shale, of shale and extract oil from those areas. So it's a really, really active area. The communities in, in the Permian, with the two biggest cities are Midland and Odessa, combined um, have about 200,000 people in them. They're seeing this just boom in population, as you can imagine. But they've seen in the past during other oil booms, but this is really on a different scale. I mean, we're seeing some impacts and some um, a level of activity there that really is unprecedented. But at the same time, it's a part of the state where we're seeing a dramatic expansion of our already really significant wind resource. I mean, Texas is the largest producer not only of oil and gas, but also of wind energy in the United States. We've got 22,000 megawatts um, installed wind capacity currently, and there's a push to build even more out there. And then solar, we're seeing some really significant new industrial scale Solar facilities being built. One of the counties out there, Pecos County, has a billion dollars worth of industrial solar uh, planned at this point. So all of that means a significant expansion of pipelines, of roads, of transmission lines, and so forth. So um, significant impact. So the project that the Mitchell Foundation has put together is basically involves researchers from the University of Texas. So I'm, I'm the legal person on the team, the legal policy person on the team. But we have geologists and engineers as well. Um, biologists from Sol Ross University, which is a university out in far west Texas. And then the Nature Conservancy, which has sort of done these conservation by design projects in various parts of the United States. Um, in the Marcellus, particularly oriented around energy sprawl. And we're in the, in the beginning stages now of sort of documenting what's going on out there and then laying a, a, a roadmap for what might be done at the community level, really to give the communities and the landowners more of a voice in sort of citing decisions and figuring out how to minimize the impacts on their, their communities. So this is just, I'm going to whip through these really quickly to show you what's happening currently. I know this is really hard to see, but that box, if you will, has been the main focus of our research efforts up to this point. That's where we're seeing um, and anticipating the most <coughs> intensive new development of energy. So that's just the land use map. You don't need to, to really know what the colors mean too much, but I'm going to show you in a series of things what's anticipated and what we're going to see. So this is just um, solar facilities that have been permitted and are under construction currently, the yellow blobs. Now you've got wind turbines, the dark, the sort of green color, and new transmission lines. Now you've got oil and gas wells that are coming into those areas. And then this is all of it all together. So solar, wind turbines, power lines, oil and gas wells, um, and pipelines. And you can see, so first of all, the, the development is sort of creeping, as I said, down further south to parts of this region that have not experienced a lot of energy development here to four. And the, you know, basically very sparsely populated areas, but places with very important natural resources, um, as well as some intact communities that haven't been you know, dramatically affected by industrialization. We're anticipating more and more solar, as I said, because as you can imagine, in far west Texas, there's a lot of sunshine and not a lot of trees. <clears throat> this is just quickly, there actually are a number of listed threatened and endangered species, which is just one indicator of biodiversity, of course, but, but an important one. And then this is just, um, again, meant to underscore that just like so many other parts of the country, in Texas, our, these major sources of energy are located apart from our population centers. They're in the western part of the state. And all, almost all of our population, some you know, 80% of the population of Texas lives east of I-35, essentially. So the red lines, interestingly, are these high-powered 
uh, transmission lines that the state of Texas invested in about a decade ago. They're, we refer to them as Crez lines, designed specifically to bring renewable power from the wind turbines in West Texas into the population. So again, the, the types of impacts, we've been talking about these all morning. Um, there, this is actually one, one piece of our project um, has involved some public outreach and surveys and focus groups that we, we have a, a very sophisticated PR firm that's involved in this project that has done extensive work, um, public opinion surveying out in West Texas. And these are the types of concerns that we've actually heard from citizens out there. So things like reduced tourism. You know, as I said, this is the place where Texans go, they go on vacation. This is the iconic Texas landscape. People are worried about, well, what's it going to mean if we've got 18-wheeler trucks on all these roads all the time, and the landscape is now sort of dotted with more transmission lines and wind turbines and oil and gas rigs, et cetera. Dark skies which is actually quite important, um, both from a tourism perspective, but there's also a major scientific observatory out in Dallas, Texas, in the Davis Mountains, called McDonald Observatory. And um, I, had, I was there in May, I've been a number of times, but went up on the, the tower, basically, for one of the three telescopes, and walked around the outside of it, which is quite an experience. And when, at one point, when you're looking from the observatory to the northeast, into the Permian, it, it looks, you know, like the sun's coming up at 12 o'clock at night. It's quite extraordinary, with the flares and all the lights associated with the drone rigs. Um, diminished biodiversity, just caused by fragmentation and direct loss of habitat. Um, water impacts clearly associated with the oil and gas drilling that are having an impact on biodiversity and anticipate to have more. And then these more intangible pieces of it, things like just the changing way of life. And this is a, a part of rural Texas where um, the residents actually don't even want Walmart or you know, big box stores to come. They sort of like the fact that they've got to drive 60 or 80 miles in the Midland to go on the weekends to get their groceries. I mean, it's a little, you know, it's a very, very rural community. And many of these folks don't want to lose that character. And then because of the boom, you know, it's a, it's a plus and a minus. You've got this enormous influx of workers from, from elsewhere. They come in, they make a lot of money, which is terrific for them, but it changes the character of these communities. Um, there's not enough housing, there are the schools can't absorb them, the roads are taking a beating, et cetera. So the question becomes, what do we do about it, right? I mean, nobody, everybody recognizes, especially for the renewables component of this, that it's in the state's best interest to continue to encourage, as, as Texas state policy has, investment in renewable resources. Um, there is certainly an upside, which I'm going fast, so I'm not spending a lot of time on, but the, these additional dollars of investment, they're good for the communities in the sense that they bring a lot of tax revenue um, that are paying jobs for the people that live there and all those things. But how can we develop and take advantage of this incredible natural resource out in this part of the state without ruining the pieces of it, um, everything from you know, the lifestyle to the ecological resources in the process? And I'll tell you, <laughs> in Texas that's especially challenging because we have virtually no um, laws available on the books, and we can't <laughs> point to anything in our state codes that, that give us some legal leverage to try to control what's happening out there. Um, wind and solar facilities in Texas require no siting permits whatsoever. So there is some approval required by the PUC before those facilities can you know, link their power production to one of the transmission lines, and that, that's there. But there is no agency in Texas that um, issues permits for land use type permits for to develop a wind farm or solar Similarly, for oil and gas development, um, there are statewide spacing regulations that are designed to minimize you know, drainage, essentially, from oil and gas reservoirs. But very, very few restrictions on 
um, signing with oil and gas wells. You know, the, the one thing that's in our state code is the Railroad Commission can basically give municipalities the authority when they request it to impose a 100, excuse me, 200 foot setback for oil and gas wells from structures, from residences. Now, we just in Colorado had a provision um, on a referendum on the ballot which failed, but it would have required a 2,500 foot setback from oil and gas wells from existing structures, so schools, residences, and then a number of environmentally sensitive spots. In Colorado, even without that, we've got a thousand foot setback from those structures. So this is really minimal. Um, cities in Texas, the city of Denton tried, did pass an ordinance uh, about six years ago that would have limited hydraulic fracking within the city boundary. Our state legislature um, enacted a law that made that ordinance move essentially and stripped local governments from the ability to, re to regulate the oil and gas um, industry from a siting perspective, except in a few limited circumstances. Our counties have no zoning authority at all, so they can't, counties have no land use authority. And then we also, on top of all of that, don't have a Surface Damage Act, which every other state that has a significant amount of hydraulic fracking does have. So that's, um, that's what we're dealing with in this Texas. It's interesting. So rather than um, trying to mobilize a lot of different groups to go lobby the legislature to change the rules, which would be a difficult, if not impossible, endeavor in Texas, what we're doing instead is a community-based, landscape-scale planning initiative that um, is going to take a number of years. But the notion is that we're going to build it on the best information we can put together about the local resources, both from a biological perspective, but also from the perspective of what do people in those communities care about the most. Um, so, for example, it may end up that a particular view corridor is incredibly important to people in one of those counties, Mount Verde counties comes to mind, where a lot of the wind turbines are planned. Um, identify those things using the methodology that the Nature Conservancy has used elsewhere for, in their conservation by design program. Provide that information to the local landowners out there. In fact, it's a two-way street, collecting information from them and then providing information to the groups about what we know about the biological resources and so forth. Um, mapping that information and then trying to build some consensus with the industry, with the regulators, and with the landowners and community leaders about you know, where, where should this stuff be cited? Can we come to some agreement that some of these corridors or special places should be no-go zones potentially, which is you know, kind of a crazy concept in Texas? And then concentrate development in other areas that where there's some consensus that makes sense and that they, there's already perhaps some degraded lands, if you will, in those areas. Um, in, in other words, try to steer development to the least impactful places. And then at the same time, have a whole element of the project where we're working with private landowners to empower them to the extent they can when they do have some leverage in negotiating with um, operators, and again, that may be oil and gas or maybe a, a wind farm, to influence decisions about where the wells are placed, where the turbines are placed, how to restore the surface after operations cease, that sort of thing. So I think I'm going to, I'm just trying to go quickly so we'll have time to, to um, talk about this. But again, the goal is to come up with a plan that has some broad buy-in from the industry, from the communities, from landowners, from environmental groups. Um, and then do our best to execute that plan on the ground by working directly with the industry leaders and with the regulators. Some of us have this pipe dream that this process could be translated into a statewide process eventually. There's been some talk about doing that, some formulating a statewide energy plan that would address some of these same, same elements, but one step at a time, our focus right now is for West Texas. So I'll stop with that. Okay, we have some time for, for questions for the panel. I have a few uh, in my back pocket um, that I'm happy to ask, but I'd like to turn the audience over. So, I have a question for Ms. Taylor. Um, so, you
Okay, thank you. So how much um, has the policy kind of decisions around the Texas interconnection situation influenced some of these issues? And then related, um, is Texas followed Dillon's rule or is it like a home rule state? And how is that kind of playing into the whole issue? So Texas, Texas is a home rule state. So we have, the cities have only, is this on? No. People, people can hear me, it's fine. Okay. Texas is a home rule state, so the cities have only the authority that the legislature gives them. Um, one piece, that, so the Texas interconnection, do you mean that because of the fact that Texas is largely off the rest of the grid? So you have the eastern interconnection, right. the western You're and right. That's because from a policy perspective, way back, um, that's been the way that it's been wanted to continue, the desire to continue that matter. Yeah, you're very, you're very right. You're absolutely right. So I think it's something like 90% of, of the population of Texas is on just the, the ERCOT grid, right? Yes. Um, I think 75% of land mass or something like that, yeah. And the there are three points from ERCOT that are connected to New Mexico and one to off to the east. But those, yeah, we're very careful in Texas not to do a lot of importing or exporting of energy, except in sort of emergency type situations. Very much a policy decision that the state wants to not be regulated by the work. Right. So, and yeah. there was some concern because last year I think they had to do some imports to meet their peak demand during the summer season. Yes. So that could be playing into kind of a policy decision that would make them want to, make people in the legislature want to encourage more development. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point, right? I mean, there, there will be interesting, the, the anti-federal government sentiment in Texas is so strong that I, I think, yes, I think that could spur a lot of innovation in Texas in terms of thinking about how we manage our grid to make sure we can forestall that. The interesting other piece that's going on in Texas, though, is there's so much energy development occurring in Mexico that would be so easy for us to import and export either, you know, electricity to Mexico. And a lot of business people in Texas want to see more of that, but, but I think that's one countervailing just on that one piece. Right, well, related to that, too, um, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation just went entered into some agreements with the Mexican government. Um, it was either this year or just last year. So they're, they're developing their sort of regulatory model in Mexico to for the reliability in that, but may actually make it more viable. Are there any, any other questions for the panel? I've got one here. So uh, this is, I think, directed to start with one that Marilyn or the others can jump in. But, so we accept that energy infrastructure investments are going to take place. So we accept that energy infrastructure investments can change of, of the landscape in the rural community. What are, can you be specific about what are some steps to, from a proactive side, before those investments take place that actually engages local community Powerful to be dealing with the investments to make sure that it, you know, it's something that, that they actually want and takes place in a way that they feel is beneficial for the community. Yeah. So what? Well, yeah. So our our piece, our project. This is actually kind of a massive project that I touched on the, the sort of most substantive pieces of it. But there, we're we're actually doing a whole sort of PR campaign that's statewide, that's being led by this public relations firm. So it'll be things like um, paid media, unpaid media, documentary, because one piece is to sort of raise the visibility. Not, again, people in Texas love Far West Texas, and people know it's unique. They go out there and visit Big Bend, et cetera. But they have no idea that there's all of this new energy infrastructure that's actually may impact that. So part of, there's sort of this backdrop that's intended to create buzz about the need to address it. And then with our project, though, um, part of it is 
at a more micro level, creating a visualization of what's happening. So we've got computer modelers looking at, you know, what's it going to look like to drive down I-10 when you're heading west where they've been once all of the oil and gas wells, wind turbines, et cetera, are built. What's the, what are you going to be looking around and seeing? Um, part of it is there, some of these plays, one in particular in a place called the Alpine High in Reeves County, it's mainly one operator, it's Apache oil and gas. So we're trying to talk to Apache directly about what can, you know, how much flexibility do you have, Apache, with all these 300,000 acres of leases that you've signed about locating your wells and trying to concentrate development in portions of that county and not just sort of poking holes across the entire landscape, which is another thing. So there's that direct communication piece going on. Um, and then there's sort of a, we're creating, it sounds incredibly complicated, it's sort of complicated, but we're creating this uh, coordinating committee of community leaders who are people, um, county commissioners, um, local industry leaders, large landowners who are active in their communities, um, some environmental involvement, to try to do this sort of landscape planning exercise where we take the scientific information about the resources, we combine that with what we've heard from the communities about places that they care most about, and then lay it down on that and say, you know, what can we do? Can we create some incentives to encourage development in these places where we you know, have some consensus is are appropriate for intensive energy development, and what would it take to keep you out of these other places? And that's tricky because a lot of the landowners, of course, want their royalty checks. Um, from the oil and gas sector, or they can make $8,000 per turbine per year for wind development. So it's not fair to them to cut that off entirely. So that's those are some of the things we're trying to figure out as well. And maybe that we can work on some pooling agreements, you know, that, which makes people nervous. But there may be some things we can do at the least by least level to help as well. Are there any others on the panel that want to I wanted to ask a little bit about um, environmental attributes. Um, harking back to Harrison Blake's slides, specifically, anybody can speak to this. Um, the idea that, so speaking of the biomass export to Europe, carbon prices in Europe are at all time 10 year high. I'm wondering how much that plays into that. And then, since thinking about environmental um, effects as a non-market impact and how internalizing that affects the whole dynamic of this. Um, curious. Yeah, I mean, it, it really goes to Harrison's point about which, you've got two different factors. You've got the environmental factors and you've got the uh, structural institutional policy factors, right? So I mean, even, even on this point of the um, wind, you look at wind maps as an environmental factor, it's just in the center of the U.S. We have solar everywhere, you know, and you know, Germany, Germany has a different model than we do that focus on distributed renewables. Um, and in the US, we focus on these concentrated, a bit larger, large scale utility um, solar. And so um, that's a policy institutional uh, situation. Um, and, and the reason that we don't do it in the US, we've got 88,000 subnational governments with different levels of land use authority that can disrupt, right? You've also got the utilities that are entrenched that don't want people putting free electricity on the grid and not paying for the transmission and things like that. Um, but, but yes, I mean, the, the, the European situation, it all goes back to uh, drivers based upon subsidies. You know, the, the Euro England would not, Drax would not be importing biomass from the US if it weren't for a huge subsidization because it's costly for them to do that. It's a pure policy choice that they want to put money into investing in this because of the climate impacts uh, or, you know, well, though that's disputed, what they see as a better climate alternative and also reducing global resources. And so, um, so it's a complete policy choice that, that does drive a lot of this export. And in the U.S., we don't really have that. I've been asked to write a chapter on biomass and electricity generation sector in the U.S., and I'm like, but we don't really do that. <laughs> we, don't, we don't do that here. But I'm going to get into some of the reasons why we don't uh, in that chapter. But um, it's all policy Yeah, to the... Uh, to the extent that, that the UK is in, uh, importing a lot of the carbon pricing part of it, they also have a separate carbon tax in the UK, except for that. Uh, and then they also have direct subsidies for that. I mean, this is in the end, it's, nobody's going to do this unless it makes economic sense. 
In the U.S., we have a uh, very limited uh, internalization of these externalities. We have an SO2. We had an SO2 market. It's basically gone now. We have more uh, with the uh, cross-state internet cross-state air pollution rule uh, that's replaced. It's more uh, directly. Uh, we have an office market to internalize some of these externalities. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting when we start thinking of uh, in CO2, we have nothing except for uh, Reggie in the Northeast and California's uh, policy is um, Washington State failed to pass their second intention of the carbon tax. Um, one thing that's important to consider though, when we think about these externalities uh, associated with the um, uh, emissions, is that those are also spatially very heterogeneous. Um, and so, to the point that Melinda was talking about, the Reds, one of its largest value is the fact that it takes that wind energy from West Texas to the east and offsets east generation. So I have a paper on that that I'm working on right now, and we calculate back in the envelope annual environmental value of CREDS, being able to move that power from rural West Texas to eastern uh, uh, parts of the state where the people live is about 400 million per year on just the environmental value of it. And that's because the environmental damages in east, from emissions in east Texas are way higher than they are from west Texas there's way more people who live in East Texas than West Texas. Right? Um, so as we go forward, um, uh, clearly if we internalize more of these externalities, we can see more development. But that might also impact where we do some of this development. Because CRES was a $7 billion uh, transmission expansion project. Uh, so that's a, it's a massive investment. Um, uh, I think if we internalize some of these externalities, it's going to change the market prices uh, of power. That's going to dictate to some degree where we build some of this stuff. So, James, we are at time. We have time for one more. Do we have one more question? Um, so, just real quickly, how about the other end of it? When the economics, when the economics don't make sense anymore, subsidies go away, technology makes new things that are generating electricity, for example. What's going to happen to the infrastructure? Because my understanding is generally with these large, like we have a large generation facility, like traditional um, generation, uh, coal, nuclear, those kind of synchronous generation, like you have to plan for the decommissioning and put things back like they were. Is this happening with these private investor projects like wind turbines? That, that's another huge issue in Texas. We're having lots of discussions about what happens to the wind turbines when they eventually need to be replaced or you know they're not going to be used anymore, right? And during our last legislative session, almost two years ago, there was a bill introduced that didn't, didn't make it anywhere that would have made it the operator's responsibility to decommission those those turbines. But it, that bill did not pass, and it's very much up in the air. But there's considerable concern about that. I mean, it's a legitimate issue. One of the interesting things about the biomass electricity wood pellets is a lot of the um, coal fire, I mean, a lot of the, the paper mills are being retrofitted. So there's a, like some adjustment you can do with some of the infrastructure to to, uh, to, to adjust existing infrastructure transition into different types of infrastructure. But I think, um, yeah, you're right. I mean, those UK subsidies so go away and drafts go away. Like tomorrow we've got a lot of stranded assets with these, um, with all these wood pellet bills. Um, and so I do think that's, uh, you know, I don't even know the California policy allows for forested offsets and, and different things, right? And so there's, you know, if you have a driver, if we had a national level policy, carbon tax or whatever, I think it would provide some stability for these investments to know that we can make these investments. Of course, then you're going to get debates about whether we should be doing this from a carbon tax perspective, offsets and burning wood pellets and things that, but I do think you're right. It's on sh very shaky ground, and, and I don't know. If there's there's not an exit plan for the wood pellet plants. I know that for sure. Um, it's it, and that's been the nature of wood pellet our forest industry for a long time. You just just build it when it's there, and when it goes away, you just turn it into something else. Then when we think about decommissioning too, uh, the environmental cost of decommissioning, the environmental cost associated with these plants is not equal, right? So uh, as we we the the rules that were largely set in place for decommissioning these plants realize that these plants cannot just be abandoned uh, because of their uh, particular environmental uh, hazards that are associated with them. 
um, clearly uh, leaving a nuclear reactor uh, idle uh, with nobody watching it has a lot more environmental potential hazards than leaving a wind turbine stranded in the middle of nowhere, West Texas. Right? Um, so uh, while, while there are, as Lynn said, they're still coming to terms with these, I, I think the, uh, the, impending, um, uh, the impending collapse of, the, uh, of a lot of the, the uh, incidents in run coal plants makes this a much more pressing issue. Um, and, and then you combine that with the fact that they are much more environmentally uh, harmful from a decommissioning standpoint. At least winter, I think solar might be a bit of a Well, I think we're in time. We're going to have one more round of applause for the panel.